The Lord be with you. Grace and peace to everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. We welcome you this morning to worship here at Broadway Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We are grateful to be gathered here in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, we wish to welcome you all, a double welcome to all of you who have lost an hour of sleep to come and be with us. And so we are so glad that you are joining us this morning, both time change and also spring break uh, make things a little bit difficult uh, this, this week, but we are so glad that you are here. And if you are just showing up for Sunday school, we're glad that you made it for church. Uh, as we come together today, we do welcome you all. We like to, if you're visiting among us, say that we are a church of both extraordinary worship and also extravagant hospitality, and we pray that you will find both of those things with us today as we come to worship God together. And then so in the spirit of extravagant hospitality, I invite the congregation to stand and to welcome one another with signs and words of Christ's peace. to check in and tell us where you are from as well. If you are visiting today, my name is Ryan Price and I'm the senior pastor here. And wherever it is that you are joining us, uh, either in this beautiful sanctuary or in all of the sanctuaries of the world, we welcome you and are so glad that you are with us today. We continue in the season of Lent. Uh, these are the days of reflection and penitence. Uh, also a time where we begin to read some of the lengthier stories of Jesus' encounters. And we will receive one of those today with the woman at the well. You will see and hear scripture that speaks of the waters that uh, we drink from as we journey in uh, our Christian uh, pilgrimage in following Jesus as far and as faithfully as we possibly can and seeking and depending on God's provision as we go along. So as we come then into this hour of worship, we come seeking uh, the living waters of God, and we pray that the Spirit of Christ will come and be near unto all of us today as we worship God together. And as we then prepare ourselves for this hour and time together, I say unto you, lift up your hearts.
Join me in the call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God and a great ruler above all gods. The sea is the Lord's, for God made it, and the dry land, which God's hands have formed. Please pray with me. Here we come, Lord. We clean up pretty well, and we probably won't make much trouble during the service this morning. But you know a lot of us left a mess right outside that we think we have to pick back up on the way out. We're not always careful with each other out there. But we come here and we remember that you do surprising things. You ask the unexpected from us. You see goodness in us we may not even believe in yet. Thank you for trusting us to be part of your work in the world. Help us have the grace, wisdom, kindness, and steadfastness to stay engaged in it. And thank you that you drew us today to this place where we meet you 
and are refreshed. reading from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you, take some, take in your hand the staff which, with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the walk and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord.
Britton and I joined Broadway in 1979. It was the first Sunday of Advent. Britton had come to be minister with adults at Broadway, and I came to teach English at Trinity Valley School. Neither of us, although we had grown up in Baptist churches, had ever experienced an Advent service before, and we both loved it. The decorations, the special music, the candles, and the banners. I especially loved the banners. And I remember the one that was used on that first Sunday of Advent in 1979. It had a manger on it, and it was blue. And when it's chosen on successive Sundays of Advent to be used, I still get tears in my eyes thinking about that banner. Up until then, we had grown up, as I said, active Baptists. I grew up at First Baptist Church Harlingen in the Rio Grande Valley and Britain in Beaumont in Southeast Texas. We had both been active in youth programs of all kinds in our churches. We had gone to youth camps. We had gone on mission trips. And we met the summer of my freshman year in college. We were both active in the Baptist Student Union and this was a state Baptist Union choir that we were both in during Texas churches and singing and ending up at Glorietta Baptist Encampment. We met on that choir tour and married in 1956. Over the next few years, we were busy raising three children while Britton went to seminary and then he was a campus minister for 10 years and then the first single adult minister in the Southern Baptist Convention. I got my PhD in American literature and taught English in various schools over that time. But back to the advent of 1979, I still remember that sermon. It was about the shepherds. Shepherding apparently was a profession that changed in reputation over the years. Before he became King David of Israel, David was a young teenager who showed up delivering lunch to his brothers in the Israeli army. And he learned that a giant named Goliath of the Philistine army was taunting the Israeli soldiers and inviting them to send somebody out to meet him in a one-on-one -on -one fight. David thought it should be he, because he said, I am a shepherd. I have faced wild animals. I can certainly take this one. So he convinced King Saul to let him do it. But over the years I learned in that Sunday sermon, shepherding had taken a nosedive as far as reputation. The shepherds slept rough. The shepherds were considered crooks. The shepherds could not even give testimony in a court of law because nobody trusted their word. They were notorious liars. And yet, on that night when Jesus was born, the angels put on a terrific sound and light show just for the shepherds. Those angels could have announced Jesus' birth in downtown Jerusalem. They could have gone to the courtyard of Herod's palace and told him. Instead, they came to a marginalized group of people, spoke directly to them, and asked only that they go find this new person who was going to be on their side. Then the sermon went on to be about Broadway. Broadway was a church who could include everybody. Everybody was welcome to the Messiah scene. Everybody was welcome who wanted to participate in the agape meal. 
Broadway was a church who had room for everybody, from CEOs to shepherds. I was recently nominated to be a deacon at Broadway. And like other deacons, I had to decide whether to accept the nomination or not. I had many reasons why not. I was too old. I was way too tired. <laughs> and I was a klutz at technology. And so, while I was thinking it over, two things happened. I heard a sermon from Ryan emphasizing that same Broadway mission of room for everybody, a gospel for everybody, hospitality for everybody. And I thought back to the scene with the shepherds and the first words that the angel said to the shepherd are the same words that we find in the Old Testament and the New Testament over and over again. It seems like when heaven speaks to earth, it's always these words that come first. Don't be afraid. So I accepted the nomination because I believe in the mission of Broadway and I hope you do too. So next week, keep those words in mind. Don't be afraid. Let's pray together. Oh God, our creator, we praise you with joy and thanksgiving during this time of worship for you are the rock of our salvation and the lover of our souls. You have created all that is beautiful and good and holy. You have created us as your children with the ability to live in community with you and with each other. We ask your forgiveness for the times in which we take these gifts for granted or the times in which we forget that you are the giver of all goodness and love. Forgive us, O oh God, when we do not love all of creation and all of people in the same way that you do. Today we remember with gratitude the greatest gift you gave us in the person of Jesus. You showed us through Jesus how to love ourselves no matter who we are or how society might define us. Jesus taught us that we are dearly loved even when our past is brought into the light and everyone can see our limitations. We ask that we might humbly accept your love and that we might live out of the abundance of your mercy. Finally, O oh creator of love, we ask that you transform us into people who embody this kind of Jesus love. That we might look into the face of every person we encounter and see your image there. That we might be a people who work in the name of Christ to give dignity to anyone who has been told they do not deserve it. And may we empower each other and all people to arrive each day at the fountain of your love and drink from the cup of grace and your ever flowing living water. Amen.
The gospel lesson this morning comes from the fourth chapter of the book of John, picking up with the fifth verse. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sichar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a Samaritan, for a drink of water? For Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to come here to draw water again. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Well, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that this place, that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation comes from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. And God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called the Christ And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? And then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. And she said to her people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city, and they were on their way to him. 
This is the gospel of grace. Being that we just marked International Women's Day and have been given here a very famous or infamous woman in the text, I thought I would spend my time this morning talking about Jesus' relationship with women in general. If you pause to think about Jesus' encounters with women in the scriptures, they were most, if not all, positive. While not numbered necessarily among the 12 apostles, strictly speaking, women are nonetheless very prominent in the overall Jesus story. And the encounters and relationships Jesus has with women are very important to the story. Think of all of the references to women recorded in the canonical gospels. Mary and Martha, whom Jesus met and ate with regularly. Mary of Migdal, whom Jesus clearly had a special relationship with. The woman with the bleeding issue, the daughter of the synagogue leader, the mother of the wife of Peter. <laughs> Can you imagine being the mother-in-law to the apostle Peter? Pray for that woman. The widow at Nain, the woman bent over, the woman with the costly nard poured out on Jesus' head, the women, including Joanna, Susanna, and Salome, who with their own personal means provided for Jesus throughout the course of his ministry, and all of the other many, many women whom Jesus was referring to when he pointed to his disciples and said, here are my mother and my sisters. And added to these are also Mary, Jesus' mother, who did not always understand the mission of her son, but who loved him deeply and whom he deeply loved back and the foreign Syrophoenician woman with whom Jesus had a little repartee <laughs> and who, it turned out, was pivotal in teaching Jesus that his mission and ministry would not be just for the Jews, but also for us dog, dirty Gentiles. And of course, there is the woman caught in adultery when with rocks held tight in their hands, the men brought the woman to Jesus, eager to stone her. Jesus did not quote the Bible in condemnation, but squatted down himself into the dirt and began to write in the dust and then stood up and said, let he who is without sin be the one to cast the first stone. John Claypool, who was pastor here in the 70s and a great advocate for the path we took in choosing to ordain women here at Broadway, was once asked what he thought Jesus was writing there in the sand before that menacing crowd, John said he thought maybe Jesus was writing, where is the man? Then finally, today there is the woman at the well 
who herself was also a foreigner, a Samaritan, and who had, and still has, as I said, a famous or infamous reputation. I want to be, this morning, very careful with what I say about this woman and her story. She was, by the account of the scripture, married five times, we are told. And the man whom she was with now at the time of her encounter with Jesus there at the well was not her husband. So of course, of course there was talk and she has come down to us over the centuries as a divorcee, and she's also in many contexts come down to us as possibly a harlot. And that is the reason we've been told time and time again that she came to draw water alone, that she was there on business. That may all be true or untrue. She may have been five times divorced or her husbands may have all died. We don't know. In either case, it would not be altogether surprising that a woman in her situation would have been left by society in a place of desperation. And we should not then condemn her if she was desperate enough to turn to sex work in order to feed herself or her children. Many women in the world have. Even around here. Some of you know that this area of town here in Fort Worth used to be called Hell's Half Acre. It was basically the red light district of our city and I just recently learned that some of the streets around our church are named after women who worked them. Luda and May are two that I know of. And while it is a long-standing tradition to preach against these kinds of women and their wares, crusades against other people's so-called sin always makes people feel good. That is not the way that Jesus treated the woman caught in adultery, nor the woman at the well. Jesus did not condemn the woman at the well, nor importantly did he try to take advantage of her either. Here she was, a desperate and likely destitute woman, and Jesus treated her with respect, and with dignity as he did with other women and had a reputation himself for doing so. And that is the reason why so many women loved and cared for and believed in Jesus. Because amongst the women themselves, Jesus had a reputation as a man of honor, 
a man who respected women. And that is why in the story, the woman at the well goes back into the city and gathers all of the women and the men and says, come and see a man who can be trusted. He could be trusted even when he was alone with a woman. The great evangelist Billy Graham famously had a rule that has come down to us called the Billy Graham rule which said he could never ever be alone with a woman who wasn't his wife anywhere, not even for lunch in a public place. And that was seen for many, many decades as a great solution for men in order to avoid temptation. And it was commended for everyone. And I must say, I can understand the reasoning. But with all due respect to Billy Graham, who once preached here, in fact, more recently, women have helped me to see how this rule has perpetuated a patriarchy that kept women locked out of places of power and decision-making. It kept women off of the business trips and out of the golf games and behind their desks while the boys were out to lunch together. Keeping women out all for the purposes of keeping men from their own temptation. Jesus was alone with this woman. It surprised even his male disciples, but he behaved himself. And he lived consistently with his teaching, which said that when we are tempted, it's our own eye that causes us to sin and not the face or the body or the clothing of somebody else. Jesus taught that we men can control ourselves and should. And these are things that I'm learning in order, I hope, to be myself a better man and a better boss and a better human being. And I hope also that it makes this church a better place for women to work, pastor, and be pastored. Because I can't imagine the first female pastor of this church not ever letting any guys go with her out to the golf course. Now, I wish to say one more thing about the way that Jesus treated women in general and this woman at the well in particular. And what I want to say comes out of my own family experience. My maternal grandmother was married three times, not counting the relationship she had with my biological grandfather, whom she never wed and whom my mother never knew. And my grandmother's sister was married 
seven times. Now we hear that and we could snicker at it, but I'm telling you that for these two sisters, there was a whole, whole lot of pain in their stories. And neither of these two women's lives ended very well. And for the woman at the well, regardless of what exactly was her story, there had to be a lot of pain and probably a lot of snickering. And I wonder to myself, how would the life of this woman at the well have turned out had she not on that day met Jesus? Or we can remember and think about another so-called sinful woman who came and washed Jesus' feet and dried them with her hair. The Pharisee whose house Jesus was at snickered and said to himself, if he knew what kind of woman she was, he wouldn't let her touch him. But Jesus said to him, I tell you that her great many sins are forgiven, so she loves greatly. But he who is forgiven little loves very little also. And I think it is because of that, because Jesus stood up for, for women, especially the most vulnerable of women, that so many of them loved and believed in him so much. And I wonder, I wonder if a great deal of the snickering contempt so many men seem to have towards women doesn't really, at the bottom of, at the end of the day, have to do with their own unconfessed and unforgiven sin, their own secret sins, their own secret desires, secret lust, secret sense of their own self-deceptions. That is why it's always easier to imagine and fight the sins of others than it is to admit and deal with our own. Come and see a man who knows all my secrets, the woman says. And she says it to the whole town, both the women and the men. And at the end of the two days that Jesus stayed there in that Samaritan town, the people of the city said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard it for ourselves. And we know that this man is truly the savior of the world. He is the savior of the Jews and the Gentiles, the Samaritans and the Syrophoenicians and all of the other sinners of the world. He's savior of the women and of the men and of the non-binary people also of whom there are many. And, and he is also savior of me. 
And I can tell you that in believing in him, I have become a better man and a better friend to both women and men. Because believing in Jesus makes us more compassionate, less judgmental, less condemning, more inclusive, and more forgiving of both ourselves and also others. Because he opens to us a well inside ourselves where we can draw from the waters of God's deep love, taste and see that it is good, all of this grace poured out on our lives and find that we have enough left over to share with others also. He opens a well of overflowing love where we can face the truth about ourselves and others without the kind of judgment that condemns, but the grace that reconciles and redeems. This is the healing water I have found in Christ. And it is the water I wish to give to you also. So at the risk of plagiarism this morning, <clears throat> Let me end my sermon by preaching with the same words spoken in the sermon from this woman at the well so many long years ago. Come and see a man. Come and see a man who is good with women and good with men and helps me be good to myself. Come and see a man full of God's grace and God's truth and see if he may well be just the kind of man you could hope for and believe in too. Come and see. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, mother of us all, and together all of God's people then say, Amen and Amen. Come and see, come and drink from this water. Come and find the grace 
that you need for your life. Come and discover that you can drink, never run dry, and have enough to give to all of the world also. The invitation is here. May anyone who would wish to come and be a part of this church walk this aisle this morning.
Please join me in prayer. Creator and artist of souls, you sculpted a people for yourself out of the rocks of wilderness and fasting. You brought us through the desert and barren land. You have provided us with water when we thirst. For all these things, we are grateful for your provisions. Throughout history, you have used women to proclaim your message. The ancient Chinese proverb says, women hold up half the sky. We give thanks to you, O God, that you created a vision where women were created in your image and have an equal purpose in your world. In times of both weakness and strength, you have walked with us and provided what we need. To this we give thanks and place all our trust in you, O God. Amen.
Before we conclude our service today, I do wish to invite you all out to Camp Broadway this evening. Uh, we have a very special uh, theological film screening of The Secret Life of Pets. And we're going to have a great time. And uh, the doors, uh, the gate of the camp opening, I think around 4 o'clock. The movie's at 7.45 or so. Um, it's going to be a fun time this evening. And I hope to see you there. Um, bring your children and uh, come and enjoy the fellowship and community. It may be a little chilly, so uh, wear a jacket, bring a jacket and maybe a blanket. And let's have fun together this evening as we go forth from here. Uh, we are continuing in this Lenten journey. And God has given us today the opportunity to drink from the rock, to have our spirits replenished by the grace of God in the face of all of human sin, and to find within ourselves the courage and the strength to go forward. So let us do just that as we depart from here. Depart now, beloved. The Spirit of God and Christ in you. For the world needs your light, and your hope, and your deep, deep courage. So go and be strong. Be kind, be brave, and be love, or something like that. <laughs> Always be love. Amen.